I'm thrilled to be here at Gallaudet, come back to my alma mater. I have my master's in linguistics, I graduated from here, and then my PhD in psychology, so it's nice to be back home. As uh, has already been explained, I work uh, in RIT at the Deaf Studies Lab, and you can see my team here on the slide. Many of you may have heard of the term autism. It's not a new term, and it was coined in 1977 by Dr. Tom Humphreys. He wrote about that term in his PhD dissertation. And by autism, he meant some attitude which was prejudiced against people according to their hearing status. So some idea that deaf people were broken, needed to be fixed, or were inferior. And that if you wanted to be happy in this world, you really needed to be hearing. Linguisticism is related to autism, and the first time I heard that term was when Dr. MJ Bienvenu uh, was presenting at RIT. She was a keynote speaker at one of our conferences, and she mentioned linguisticism. And that really struck a chord with me. And it's about some prejudice against language, being, believing that one language is inferior to another. Many people do not believe, for example, that ASL is the equivalent or has the same status or, or is able to express the same things as English, for example. There are many studies which have been carried out in this field, but I want to talk about one study today which really looks specifically at the notions of autism and linguisticism. And I want to talk about the notion of resilience, psychological resilience. What do I mean by that? Of course, all people experience stress, uh, stress, disagreements, adversities. That's the nature of life. If you don't have much resilience, you have a weak resistance, weak resilience, then let's see what happens. It really knocks you back and it's hard to, to get back on your feet and really bounce back and get on with your daily life. It's very problematic. However, if you have some strong sense of resilience, what does that look like? Of course, it still knocks you back. It's just that you have the wherewithal to get back on your own two feet and carry on living your everyday life. So resilience is that power to bounce back. And it's very important for school, for universities, for success in life and mental well-being. And there are two other important terms I really want to talk about now. In terms of resilience, thinking about protective factors and risk factors. Protective factors are, of course, those things that help us develop a strong resilience. And risk factors are those things which cause our resilience to be weakened. So I just want to ask you all a question. Do we think that being, risk, being deaf itself is a risk factor? Well, the team I work with don't believe it to be the case. There are many successful deaf people out there in the big wide world who have excellent qualities of life. They earn more money than the average Joe. There are very successful deaf people in education that do much better than their hearing peers. So it doesn't appear deafness is a risk factor. But we would say that some kind of idea of internalized autism is a risk factor. That idea that you're continually exposed to being needed to be fixed or that you're broken, if you internalize, the, internalize, internalize those ideas that you need to be fixed, then we feel that that in and of itself is the risk factor. So we wanted to see if we could set up an experiment to test if that were the case. Well, I suppose the big question is how do you measure resilience? But there are a number of tests which are available out there, and we used one which has been used with uh, teenagers and young adults to ask them a variety of questions about their resilience. And it's a multiple choice, just a pen and paper exercise, so we use that task. So I suppose the next question is how do we measure internalized autism? And this is kind of where the fun starts. In the research field of social cognition, they have a variety of 
different methods, one of which actually is used to measure racism, sexism, and other times of prejudices. So we borrowed that mainstream test and actually tried to adapt it for uh, autism. It's a computer-delivered test, and the idea is that you push computer buttons and you measure reaction times. And this just gives you an idea of what it looks like. So I want you to remember these pictures. There's one set of pictures there which says something good, and there's another set of pictures which demonstrate bad things. So please take a good look. So if we now look at the screen, you can see we have good on one side and bad on the other. So if you see something that's good, I want you to point to the side which represents good. And if you see something bad, I want you to point to the side that represents bad. Okay, so that's good. Well done, people. You're with me. And that's bad. I can see you get it. Okay, so here's a little practice for you. Well done, everybody. It was quite fun, actually, to watch you all pointing into empty space. So now let's uh, play with another idea. If we think about the idea of deaf and hearing people, you don't have to remember the faces, but if it's a blue framed picture, then it means they're deaf. And if it's a yellow framed picture, it means they're hearing. OK. So I'm going to do exactly the same as before, only I want you to point in the space that represents deaf and point in the space that represents hearing. OK, here we go. Yep, you're with me. Well done. That was the practice. OK, that was actually the practice. Now I want to start the real experiment, which has another layer of complexity. We're going to try and mix the two conditions of deaf and hearing and good and bad. If you see a picture, a, draw, a drawn picture, which is good or bad, you need to point to good or bad. And if it's framed, blue or yellow, deaf or hearing. So OK, that's right. That one's deaf. Well done. Over here is bad, yes. Let's proceed with the next stage. Now I'm going to run the test again, but now the fun starts. I'm going to swap where good and bad is. And now bad is to your right. OK. So let's, let's have a go. The way we score that is quite complicated and we have a, a fancy algorithm to analyze the data and the whole point is the reaction time. We gave that this test, we administered this test to a variety of college students. It's a computer-based test and we analyzed their reaction times in the different conditions. We were interested in when deaf and good co-occurred on the same side whether that correlated with somebody having a strong sense of deaf being good, and that was an internalized value, and if we had deaf and bad on the, on the same side, then those people obviously would have a slower reaction. However, if somebody had internalized the notion that deaf was bad, they'd have a quicker reaction time when deaf and bad were on the same side. And we were trying to see if we could use this to rate what people's internalized attitudes were, whether they identified deaf as good or deaf as bad. So, we split the group in half and we know that one side has internalized a good concept, the other bad. So those who would say deaf was good, we would say had some protective factors, strong resilience. Those who had thought deaf was bad, then we would say that they had internalized autism. 
Now, you can remember that we also had that task that we administered the multiple choice looking at resilience. Obviously, if they scored high, that meant they had strong resilience. A low score meant weak resilience. And we were interested to see how these correlated together. And we saw quite, what was interesting is those who had saw deaf as good scored the same levels of resilience as their hearing peers. which was not the same for those who thought saw deaf as bad. They clearly had internalized autism and had weak resilience. So what appear to be the protective factors? For us, we thought actually looking at deaf studies was an important field, and we often see notions of use of sign language, involvement in the deaf community, and we wanted to see if those were relevant to our groups. So again, let's think about how we can measure notions like deaf culture. There was a, uh, there is a test which is actually developed by a colleague here at Gallaudet University, the psychology department, and it asks questions about your values, your behaviors, your involvement in the deaf community, your involvement in mainstream events, for example. And again, in this graph, we saw that if there was a high score, you were highly involved in the deaf community, had deaf cultural aspects about you, and a low score, not so much. We found that those who had high levels of resistance were people who socialized within the deaf community. We were also interested in looking at sign skills, a team of us were involved in uh, developing a, a sign skills uh, test. Again, somebody from the psychology department here was involved in that. And on this score, you can see high levels of ASL fluency and low levels of fluency. Those who had stronger levels of resistance also had better signing skills. So it seems that signing seems to be a protective factor. So why is it important to use sign language and be involved in the deaf community? Well, our theory is it's about deaf capital. And by capital, I mean knowledge and skills that you get from the deaf community. It's almost like a toolbox that you can carry around with you. When you meet other deaf people, you gain knowledge from their experience of navigating the world. And so when you're out in school and something happens that's frustrating, you have the tools with you to be able to deal with that. And you may have remembered at the beginning, I mentioned the term linguisticism. I think that is the problem. Many people are not, don't value ASL. We know so many deaf people are actually born uh, without deaf parents and they don't have deaf capital. They don't have exposure to sign language. Of hearing families, less than 25% use sign language, which means many deaf children grow up with very poor, impoverished language skills. So that seems to be a risk factor. So in summary, The reason I think autism and linguisticism still happens today is because society don't know that ASL and involvement in the deaf community is important to us. We need to educate them. We need to mentor young deaf children, young deaf adults, so that they can in turn lead, educate other people and become leaders of change. Thank you very much.